Hello all, all and welcome to the program. I'm John Arula. I technically know how to do this occasionally. Uh, importantly though, I won't have to do it alone because we're very lucky to be joined once again on the program by Waz Nilambre himself. Waz, how's it going? I'm good, how are you John? I'm good, glad to have a representative of Wazia on the show today. Always glad to have you here. <laughs> well, uh, it's I'm really uh, the only representative. I'm the dictator of that. That's true. It's a, it's a one man, it's a one man country. Uh, what have you been up to lately? It's been a bit since we since we spoke. Ah, uh, just the same old same. Just working and chilling. That's it. Just just work and chill. And by chill, I mean tequila. That's it. <laughs> it's like working, <laughs> occasionally drinking. That's pretty much it. Uh, effectively, just working constantly, drinking tequila is very much uh, the 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 brand of the Rock that I get from him. That's what I expect most of his life is. So, <laughs> um, it's it's a good thing to model yourself on. In any event, we're glad to have you here because we got a lot we're going to be talking about, including several high profile sports stories, which I am in no way qualified to discuss. That's why we're bringing on uh, a sports expert to break it down. We've got some scandals, both potentially real as well as feigned. We're gonna try to figure out what the hell has been going on on Fox News over the last 24 to 48 hours. And then insane, absolutely insane stories having to do with religion. Um, have you been baptized? You might think that you are, you have been, but what if you haven't actually? We're gonna reveal your desperate need to get rebaptized potentially coming up in just a little bit. And we will be closing out the show with some news from around the world in Meanwhile In. And along the way, as we cruise towards those stories, if you wouldn't mind hitting the like button and sharing the stream, that would be great. And if you want to send us comments, tweets, super chats, all that will respond as we go. But with all that said, Waz, you ready to talk about some news? Of course, let's do it. Okay, well, buckle up because it's going to get weird during the next 90 minutes. <clears throat> The Trump family might be in a little bit of trouble when it comes to some of their financial disclosures. And that is that the group that has represented them for some time, Mazars, has apparently decided that they're gonna go their own way, so to speak. Now, the Trump family wants to sort of preempt some bad news that we're gonna discuss has been coming out throughout this week by going on the offensive against the legal cases that have been advancing against them. So Eric Trump took to Twitter yesterday. To tweet on Thursday, our team will be in front of a New York judge outlining the blatantly unethical behavior of Tish James, the New York Attorney General. There are 81 pages of videos, tweets, and fundraising solicitations, some as recent as two weeks ago, in our lawsuit for the judge to see. I don't know what pages of videos means. I, is it screenshots? Is it headlines? I don't know what you're talking about there. But anyway, their thing is, it doesn't matter what's revealed, it doesn't matter what developments there are in the cases that are advancing against the Trump family. Tish James is biased, which by the way, you can make a case that perhaps she is. She certainly doesn't seem to like the Trump family, but that hardly puts her in exclusive company. There are a lot of people who don't like the Trump family. That doesn't fundamentally stop facts from being facts. So let's talk about some facts. Let's talk about some of the developments that have happened. Uh, just this week. So Mazars USA, the accounting firm that has represented the whole Trump thing for some time. They said in a letter to the Trump Organization dated about a week ago that annual financial statements it prepared for Trump from 2011 to 2020 quote should no longer be relied upon. So almost a decade of financial statements and for something like the Trump Organization, a decade of financial statements for a group that big is going to be a lot of material, a lot of work that many people have been involved in. They're now done with that basically. They say, while we have not concluded that the various financial statements as a whole contain material discrepancies based upon the totality of the circumstances, we believe our advice to you to no longer rely upon those financial statements is appropriate. It said, that it concluded that the statements are no longer reliable based on part on the Attorney General's earlier filings. This is Tish James, which we were just talking about. Its own investigations and information the accountants received from quote, internal and external sources. The letter added that Mazars performed its work in accordance with professional standards. So was to have their accounting firm back off of a decade of financial records is fairly significant, I think. Uh, it's, it's just so much to unpack here. You wonder what the level of scrutiny of most of these bigger 
enti corporate entities financial statements what what type of scrutiny they actually ever receive in the first place if all Donald Trump and his organization had to do was just say yeah yeah no it's worth like <laughs> <laughs> this much, that's mm -hmm. it. I don't need to provide any proof of this. Um, I can just tell you, and it's fine. And you know, by the way, I think it's mighty convenient that now that the police are knocking at the door, mm. that this accounting firm is just like, nah, we take it back. <laughs> we don't stand by those <laughs> statements we sent for 10 years. We take it back, completely retracted. We don't think it was accurate. Which again, that's that's just a hilarious um unfolding of events. And then, you know, just the general Donald Trump and his whole family are a bunch of grifters and almost every single person within his orbit mm -hmm. is a grifter, scammer, con artist. This is just more proof to that fact. Yeah. Yeah, it, it certainly seems to move in that direction. Now, I'm going to give more information, but I want to make clear that like this is this is again the sort of development that will lead to a lot of headlines of a variety of people coming and being like, oh, the walls are closing it. No walls, the walls are not moving. I don't think they're now. This is does this doesn't look good for them, certainly. But that does not mean that you should be like, they'll be in jail by Thursday. No, they're they're probably not gonna be. This is not good for them. But this by itself isn't gonna, you know, throw them in jail. It can I believe it can only serve as a representation of Something that the NYAG has found that Mazars now wants to distance themselves from because they're worried about potential consequences. And bear in mind, they're accountants. Now they're rich and all of that. So in America, they're relatively insulated from legal consequences as well. But they weren't president a bit ago, so less insulated than Donald Trump is. But when they say, for instance, let's see, they received information from quote internal and external sources. That could mean so many different things. The external sources could be investigators working for the New York Attorney General. It could be that they have found information that doesn't comply with what Mazars had been reporting for a number of years. The internal sources could be people working for the Trump Organization that are now revealing that they either purposefully or were led to lie about some of these numbers. But again, we, we don't know for sure. And I also it was as a person who I don't need an entire accounting firm to do my taxes. I would have assumed that Mazars would be making sure that things are true. But I guess that's not necessarily how it works. They might have executives at the Trump organization, them get organization giving them information. They have to assume perhaps that some of that is true. That could be where the gap um, comes about. But again, that's outside of the experience of I think basically everyone watching this video right now. Yeah, 100%. Um, <laughs> if 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 a accounting firm as prominent as Mazars is like, it's fine, just let it through. That means this is just a standard practice. Um, mm -hmm. If it was something that was completely out of step with how you file, um, you file your financial statements for companies of this size, then they probably wouldn't do it because the number one rule in corporate culture, John, is always cover your own ass. That's yeah. just that's standard operating procedure wherever you go mm -hmm. um, as far as corporate wise. And another thing that people need to understand is that none of this is actually news. This all was came out like six years ago. During the Trump campaign, right? Uh, so in 2016, when Donald Trump was running for president, like New York Times did a big expose about, like, mm -hmm. you know, sort of the shady financial dealings of Donald Trump and his family, going back to what his dad was doing. So it's not as if any of this stuff is news or that it's new information. Um, I think there's just a different spin on it because it seems like finally, maybe perhaps. Law enforcement might be willing to, at the very least, give this, give this guy and his organization a slap on the wrist for mm -hmm. being such perpetual fraudsters. Yeah, 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 like massive, massive fraud that has generally gone without consequences. Not exclusively, like there was, you know, Trump University, they got in trouble for that. Some of their charity, charity stuff they got in trouble for, but. Like who doesn't believe that they were artificially inflating and de deflating their valuations of things 
when they would inflate it when they needed it to back some sort of loan they were trying to get. They would deflate it in other, like everybody knows that they were doing that. Um, the thing is, they're incredibly powerful, rich people. So it just takes forever to make any headway. This is not, if you were doing this sort of stuff, it would not be a yeah. 20 year process yeah. of investigating it. But when they're powerful, it just takes forever. Like we were talking about with Matt Gates like a week ago. They got access to his phone two Decembers ago, and they won't say whether there's anything there or not. It just takes so long, and that can make this very frustrating. But, and that's one more reason why I don't want people out there, like, we think this is important. That's why we're covering. We want to make sure that you know what's happening. But I don't want you to infuse too much emotion into an outcome that might never come, or at the very least, might be incredibly delayed in finally getting here. Wait, John, you mean to tell me you don't want to make your show about what could potentially maybe happen in a Trump conspiracy theory that might be unfolding but might not? But wait, there's another clue right there. You don't want to do that with your show, John? That sounds fun, actually, when you put it that way. <laughs> okay, maybe. Maybe he's going to jail by this weekend. Um, maybe. <laughs> Anyway, um, by the way, I, I, it's only fair for us to give a response, not just from Eric Trump, but from the Trump organization. So take a look at this spin. You might want to slow down the stream so that you can see the spin a little bit better. A Trump organization spokesperson told Axios that Mazar's letter, which we just discussed, which involves Mazar's being like, peace out, we're done. Don't have any faith in those documents we sent you. They say, that the letter indicates it's quote, work was performed in accordance with all applicable accounting standards and principles. And that such statements of financial condition do not contain any material discrepancies. This confirmation effectively renders the investigations by the DA and the AG moot. So what they're saying is, in the letter that's announcing that they say, "Oh, you know those 10 years of financial disclosures? Nah, I don't know what's up with those. That actually isn't just not terrible, but means the investigations shouldn't continue. I don't know how that works. I don't know, but that's they're very optimistic people over there working for that PR company. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> isn't that the point of, of all PR is, is positive true. spin at every single turn. But yeah, I think it, but I do think, honestly, John, as you mentioned, this is something worth watching because these are legitimate crimes, you know, and when you, especially when it depends on who you're committing the crimes against. Now, mm -hmm. if you're defrauding institutions, you know, in order to receive loans, like you might actually have to pay for that. You stiff a couple of union contracts, nah. All yeah. right, nobody cares. <laughs> that is definitely the case. That, that is how it works. Uh, oh, and bear, the, bear in mind, in terms of the end game for this, I'll close on this note. Uh, the investigation, there are multiple investigations against Trump, but the one that we're talking about here, which is taking place in New York by the Attorney General Tish James, that is a civil investigation. So supposedly, nothing immediately in terms of criminal charges can come from this, although revelations could lead to another investigation that would take three to 10 years. That could have criminal charges. This cannot. She can seek financial penalties, which in theory could do damage to or shut down the Trump organization. Maybe someday. I don't know. But don't expect it's not going to end up with him being, you know, like thrown in a jail cell or anything like that. Um, no, only you only end up in trouble with cops if what you steal costs less than $50. Then it's a serious <laughs> crime. If it's above that, it's purely civil. Let's be civil to each other. Anyway, with that said, we are going to take uh, the first break of the show. But when we come back, some drama at the Olympics. Oh, figure skaters spinning out. Mm, we'll give you all the details after this. <laughs> Okay, let's get into what you all came here for, analysis of international sporting news. The Winter Olympics are in the middle of a big scandal and centers around women's figure skating, particularly Russian skater Kamila Valieva, who tested positive some time ago for, I'm gonna say a banned heart medication. There's a technical term for it, I'm incapable of saying it. Anyway, that's a problem and it led to an analysis of should she be allowed 
to compete. Now, uh, Russian uh, uh, athletes have had several run-ins uh, in recent years in this area. Um, there was an argument made that the banned heart medication, which by the way, can apparently help you with your endurance, which would be very helpful in sports like figure skating. Uh, that her argument was contamination, which happened with a product her grandfather was taking. So reports in Russia said that there could be trace amounts of the medication getting into her system, perhaps via a shared glass or residue left on a counter. The grandfather reportedly drives Valieva, who's a 15 year old, to training with some regularity. So it isn't that she was given or took a performance enhancing medication, but she went around the house looking countertops that he had left the, the drugs on for a while and there was some sun and so some of it melted off. I don't know, I don't know, but that's the argument that was made. The argument, however, was not accepted for the most part by the Court of Arbitration for Sport, which ruled early this week that the 15 year old Russian figure skater would be allowed to compete in the women's individual figure skating event. But while she can compete, she will not actually be able to medal. In fact, nobody technically will be able to medal at least immediately. So it gets a little bit complicated. They said that they considered fundamental principles of fairness, her age, the fact that she's a minor, she should be a protected person. And so the complicated and controversial decision they came out with was is that should Miss Valieva finish amongst the top three competitors, which everyone expects that she will, in the women's single skating competition, there will be no flower ceremony and no medal ceremony taking place. They would withhold medals until after her doping case is resolved, which might be for months, which means that she wouldn't get them and the other people who might get the other medals wouldn't get them either. So that's that seems like a really weird decision. Is, is that something that's happened before that you're familiar with? No, but it's in line with how the IOC tends to handle business. It's a very murky, some would say shady organization mm -hmm. with all kinds of political back dealing that goes on all the time. Um, For people at home, basically what they're doing here is they're splitting the baby, right? Uh, they don't want, they don't want if some for somebody who is able to beat this case on appeal uh, as this young Russian skater, they're just like, look, if she's able to beat the case on appeal, at least she will have competed and then we'll do a medal ceremony at the appropriate time and then everything will be fine. Even though it's like mm -hmm. the whole point of training for four years for the Winter Olympics is that you get to do this at the Olympics, mm -hmm. at the medal podium at the Olympics. So. It's kind of ridiculous. And it's like, you know, they're saying, look, we want to protect the people who have not tested positive. But also, if we've somehow made a mistake, we don't want to, you know, completely shut this young woman out of her opportunity to earn medals. But again, if you're somebody who hasn't tested positive and this person saying, oh, her stuff was contaminated, you don't want to hear that. It's mm -hmm. not your fault. You came in. You were quote unquote clean um, and you should be able to compete and not have your entire experience be tainted by this person's mess up. Exactly, yeah, 100%. And people are asking in the chat, well, like what if she comes in second? Shouldn't they still give away the gold? And I get why they wouldn't wanna do that, they wouldn't wanna split it up. But, and by the way, and, and like you raise so many good <laughs> points about like she could be totally innocent. It could have been the sure. counter thing that I sketched out. Um, sure, well, but she's. But probably but, not. <laughs> but she, she probably took the drugs. Um, or let's be fair, was given the drugs or potentially forced mm -hmm. to take the drugs. Um, but anyway, yeah, like you, you, you work for years to get there. It's not like everyone's gonna tune back in in three months to watch the award ceremony. And I know that in the end, maybe it doesn't matter, but like not everybody gets to go to the Olympics like five times. Like you get that medal, that might be your only medal. It's such a big thing, um, and so I understand why there would be a lot of people frustrated with this. Some, um, you know, former, you know, in, including uh, Olympic, you know, medal-winning uh, figure skaters have weighed in on this. So, uh, Una Kim, um, she won the women's individual event back in 2010. She put up an Instagram post saying, "Athlete who violates doping cannot compete in the game. This principle must be observed without exception. All players' efforts and dreams are equally precious." Uh, Johnny Weir, by the way, a two time Olympian, said, I can't condone the decision. There was a positive drug test. Therefore, the athlete who tested positive, at fault or not, 
regardless of age or timing of test and result, should not be allowed to compete against clean athletes. So that's their opinion. I, there, there is still, I guess, the possibility that she she didn't do it, but I don't know. And 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 maybe maybe I'm biased. The fact that it's you know it's the Russian team, and we know that they have had yes. a loose relationship <laughs> with the rules. Was what do you think? Yes, they they don't have a clean slate here, or you know a spotty record. Like their record is actually the opposite of constantly flouting the rules in this specific way, like using drugs to um, enhance their performance on the Olympic stage. Uh, again, people need to understand how a ruling like this even gets rendered. Like God only knows what type of phone calls or meetings were had in order for this to happen. And I think another thing that people are upset about is sort of the inconsistency of how they deal with doping, mm-hmm. um, you know, people will remember Shikari Richardson, uh, American sprinter. She ended up, you know, testing positive for weed, but doing the opposite of this and not saying, you know, I did not inhale. Uh, mm-hmm. She basically <laughs> was like, I did it because I was dealing with anxiety issues, the loss of loved ones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. And they just banned her. Uh, you know, I'm also not a sports puritan. I tend to think we go a little bit over the top about this anti-doping, anti-drug stuff. Uh, look, if if somebody's taking a heart um, uh, medicine that helps with their breathing and helps them, you know, basically calm down better. Uh, yes, that's going to help them be better at executing triple axles and whatever the case may be. But like. Should skaters not be allowed to do this? Like, well, do we not want to see people perform as incredibly as they possibly can. Yeah, it, it look it it is very weird what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do, and that those rules obviously change over time. I think in this case, like some of these sports have such young athletes that I would be even more mm-hmm. worried about things that can have a long term impact on your heart. And that's why I yeah. think a lot of people are particularly frustrated with the idea that Russia's, and we don't know, maybe again, maybe the counter theory is true, but maybe they are pressuring, forcing athletes to take things that will do a great deal of damage to their bodies long term because the country doesn't give a damn about their, their, their bodies long term. They want a little bit of international clout and they don't care if Valieva is able to walk in five years. Um, I don't know, I have no idea. But I think that's part of why people are worried. You're totally right to bring up the inconsistency though. Like you're still allowed to perform after taking a performance enhancing drug if you're Valieva. If you're Shakari, like you took a performance dehancing yeah. drug in weed and you're not allowed to. And she she pointed that out. She said the difference I see is I'm a black young lady. Like that she sees the inconsistency. It's ridiculous. Well, okay, so I, I will say I, I don't I, look. Of course, her her case is is different. It's almost even apples to oranges. When you mentioned mm-hmm. the type of substances being used, I don't think that the American Olympic body, um, U.S. USA Track and Field, put their whole the whole weight of their political might behind getting mm-hmm. her reinstated. Right? I think that's the big difference. And. Again, people need to understand that the participation in in the Olympics is intrinsically itself a political act. Mm -hmm. And so a country who views sports specifically um, as a way to execute a lot of their political goals and aims, I wouldn't be surprised that they put their might behind pressuring the IOC. Uh, I don't Mm -hmm. think the Olympic track and field of the United States really gave a damn that much about Shikari Richardson's case. And they were just like, it's fine, we can go without her. This is different, like this, you know, US, I mean, excuse me, women's figure skating is one of the premier events at the Winter Olympics. And the idea that the Russians would have somebody that could place um, gold potentially, I could see Mm -hmm. them throwing the kitchen sink at this issue. Exactly, yeah. And throwing the bathroom cabinet of drugs at all of their athletes in advance <laughs> of getting that. Um, but uh, d- heads up to the director, if you could get back to uh, the big New York Times graphic, we're gonna touch on one more thing. Um, maybe at the end of the day, this will all be moot. I know people are worried about 
the you know the throwing off of the whole thing because she's expected to do well, but maybe she won't. Maybe she'll do horribly, and then we can just go ahead. Oh wait, I'm finding out that she has performed, and according to the New York Times. With long, beautiful lines and the sublime grace and agility of a prima ballerina, Valieva, for a movingly sad few minutes, floated through most of the routines she performed to in memoriam as the arena was hushed. She stumbled on her opening jump, a triple axel, a jump she had trouble with during a practice earlier in the day. But she slipped back into character and continued her whirring jumps and spins as if the past week's chaos had never happened. And after her short, pro- short program, she was in first place. So now it's all messed up. <laughs> It's still all messed up. <laughs> Apparently, she, by the way, you know, heart medication or no heart medication, she's 15. Yeah. Like, Waz, I don't know what kind of athlete you were at 15, but nobody was writing poetry about the motions no. of my body when I was 15. Absolutely not. I was a decent athlete. No, no, no. Nobody has ever wrote prose this beautiful <laughs> about, you know, me trying to tackle freaking Matt Hahn from St. Anthony's. Uh, on Long Island. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I just I am I am amazed. I didn't I didn't watch the the women's um, so far this week, but uh, but I did watch the the men's uh, figure skating last week, and I think it was the the guy who came in second. He looked so young. I mean, they're all young, they're all crazy young. But he was so young. How did they do it? This is why I find women's gymnastics so amazing. They are little babies and they can do things I would never be able to do if I spent the rest of my life trying to train. It is amazing. Maybe it's the heart medication, I don't know. Maybe it's the natural talent, I don't know. Anyway, with all that said, let's turn to very different stuff. We'll, we'll be checking in throughout the week to see what ends up happening with this. But it looks like we're not gonna get medals anytime soon. So good, have fun with that. Okay, with that, let's jump into this. Fox and the right are furious about the lack of willingness of the mainstream media to finally address the biggest political news of the week. Nay, all of history, perhaps. Donald Trump put out a statement saying the press refuses to even mention the major crime that took place. This in itself is a scandal. The fact that a story so big so powerful and so important for the future of our nation is getting zero coverage from lamestream is being talked about all over the world. He's mad, Fox is mad, they're freaking out that this huge story isn't being talked about on the mainstream media. You can see this graphic they put up, a prime time media coverage of the latest John Durham allegations, zero minutes across the board. now. Of course, there's a sort of implicit lie by omission there that the mainstream media has covered it. The reason the graphic says primetime media coverage is so that they can ignore the fact that, for instance, Jake Tapper did a whole thing about these Durham things. You can see in that screenshot, they have been talking about it. But uh, there might be a reason why they're not, and we're gonna get into it. But like I said, Fox has been all about this. And for many of you in the audience who might not watch a lot of Fox News, you might just come across some of these headlines, the last day or two has just been one headline like this after the other. Uh, Jesse Waters saying, I would like to see Hillary treated the way OJ is, which that seems like a crazy thing to say. Uh, Janine Pirro at least is kind of honest when she says uh, it all comes back to Hillary Clinton. Well, yes, in the end on Fox, it does all come back to Hillary Clinton. Um, The front page of Fox News this morning says, Dems cry foul on Durham probe after bending over backward to help Mueller investigate Trump. And you'll notice that in that headline, they're not even saying that the Durham stuff is true or significant. They're saying the Dems are saying it's not true. But come on, you guys were really mean to Trump. So even if this isn't true, don't you kinda have to play ball? How is that a way for a a mainstream media news outlet to address a political scandal? But that's what they're doing. Anyway, many of you are probably wondering, but what is all this about? And we will get to it in just a little minute. But Waz, have you been following any of this? Fox absolutely losing their minds. I don't know that anybody would be surprised that I don't, I try not to keep up with Fox and because like, I feel like I'm gonna get high blood pressure every single time <laughs> I watch even a little bit of Fox News. But you know, this is this is straight out of the classic Fox News playbook. Um, anything Clinton related, they dial the volume up 
to 10 every mm-hmm. single time. It doesn't matter how important or how legitimate it might be. You know, in the case of like the email server, people are just like, well, you know, why are you using a private server for what what is correspondence during your job mm-hmm. as a civil servant? I think that's like a le- legitimate thing. Do I think Hillary Clinton was planning coups and all over the world <laughs> on her server? No, I don't. But I think the concern is legitimate. But they go from something that's, you know, kind of legitimate to like Vince Foster stuff and Durham probe and all of that. And then, yeah. you know, that's where you lose your credibility with me, honestly. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And look, let's not ignore the fact that they have a massive financial motive to be talking about certain people like Hillary Clinton. A lot of people made a lot of money criticizing And By the way, she's done a lot of things that are totally worthy, worthy of criticism. When those things are relevant, we will criticize her for that. But you can't just chase like, oh, our audience likes when we talk about Clinton. Well, I guess we're just always gonna be talking about that. And that's what they're doing. Now, again, like if you're like Waz, you might not sit down and watch a lot of this. You might just sort of absorb it, I guess, that there's something about hacking, something about spying, something about Trump. I don't know what it is, but I know that Hillary Clinton's kind of shady. So I guess there's something. What if I were to tell you that in this case, no, there's there's really nothing. They have there. This is the refried beans of news. They just went through it another time. Um, so I will try to explain what seems to be going on here. And bear in mind, you could watch all day on Fox today and not get even the little information I'm going to give you in the next minute because they're not discussing the content. Supposedly, the filings we're going to discuss. It's all just aura stuff. There's something out there. This is why they've pivoted to why isn't the media covering it? Because they can talk for hours about the media not talking about it. And meanwhile, they're not really talking about it either. They're just talking about who is talking about it and who's not talking about it. So let's talk about it. When John Durham, the Trump era special counsel investigating the inquiry into Russia's 2016 election interference, filed a pretrial motion last Friday night. He slipped in a few extra sentences that set off a furor among right wing outlets about purported spying on former President Donald J. Trump. That is the impetus to all of this. Citing this filing, Fox News inaccurately declared that Mr. Durham had said he had evidence that Hillary Clinton's campaign had paid a technology company to infiltrate a White House server. The Washington Examiner then claimed that this all meant that there had been spying on Mr. Trump's White House. So if this seems familiar, We've already done this whole story. Trump talked about this for months and months at the beginning of his presidency, but it was about Obama, that Obama supposedly had wiretapped Trump Tower. This is that, except it's no longer about Obama because their audience has moved on. Now they've just made it about Clinton. But let me give you some more information. So for one one other issue is that this isn't new. New York Times reported in October what Mr. Sussman had told the CIA that is now in those filings. The conservative media also skewed what the filing said. For example, Mr. Durham's filing never used the word infiltrate, but that has been everywhere in the coverage of it. It never claimed that Mr. Joffe's company, one of the guys discussed in this filing, was being paid by the Clinton campaign. So all of these stories about the Clinton campaign paying a company to infiltrate Trump Tower lacks the infiltration and the Clinton part of it. But Fox News doesn't care about that and they have just raced ahead in this and not just them. Like there's all these headlines from places like the Washington Examiner. Tulsi Gabbard has been on a tear tweeting about this. Again, none of it was accurate, but who's gonna let that stop them? Like who's gonna actually read the contents of the news articles about this? No, just it fits into what I wanna believe about the world. So I'm gonna go with it. By the way, the filing that all this is about never said that the White House data in question was from the Trump era, and in fact, it's not. The DNS logs in question came from Barack Obama's presidency. It wasn't it wasn't even during Clinton, like the whole thing, none of it is true was. And it's just so frustrating to try to respond to this. I just, how are you supposed to get through to people when they have so little care for what fundamentally is true about this story? I mean, you know, (laughs) these are the people that peddled the new Black Panther Party. You know, uh, like I can't really, Get bent up out of shape about Fox's mishandling of a news item. It's it's kind of again, this is just what they do. Um, we haven't seen this sort of stuff in a while because it's because 
the Clintons are so out of the public eye. You don't mm. get this kind of phony stuff as much as we used to see all the time. Specifically, man, in 2015 and 16 during that campaign, they were just that the Hillary beat was as hot mm. as it's ever been, which obviously she's running for president. They're yeah. gonna do that. But the last few years, they just haven't been able, they haven't had a boogeyman to rally around, right? Like they haven't had a Barack Obama, they haven't had a Hillary Clinton. So mm. they gotta kind of come up with stuff like they're teaching white kids about slavery in school <laughs> and that's gonna ruin them. They've they've got the, you know, they're grasping at straws and Again, this is the latest example of that. This is this is such a reach, yeah. um, you know. Even even for the Fox News outfit, I, I think you're totally right there about the, the grasping. They they want they want Obama back. They they want the glory days of Clinton. Oh God, like they would kill Biden, for that. Biden just isn't the same thing. Like they try to spice it up oh. with stuff about crack pipes or whatever, him losing his mind. But <laughs> clearly, it isn't working as well. So this is an election year. So they need something to talk about. They're gonna stay with all the CRT stuff that Waz was alluding to, but they want Clinton to be in the news because they think it will fire up their base. That's why every week they do another day's coverage of Clinton might be running in 2024. There's no information to lead to that. And by the way, all of this might seem like, hey, you're you're doing a bunch of defending of Clinton. What, do you think that she's great? No, she's terrible. And she is corrupt yeah. in all of the ways that virtually all of them are corrupt. But we can criticize the bad, awful, corrupt things about them that are rooted in reality and facts. And not just conveniently for our own like analytics reasons, invent out of whole cloth conspiracies that have the end result of further like creating a, a, an ever widening gap of people's need to have the stories that we discuss be founded in truth. I want us to be able to talk about the real world. I want there to be an attachment from the news to the world. And that, like, this is not it. This gets people fired up. It plays into the tribal, partisan world that we live in. But it's not true. It's just not true. Anyway. Hey, at least we got some really fresh merch the past weekend. Um, John, did you see that? Hillary Clinton dropped the but her emails merch. Um, no. Swanky stuff. I can't wait to get my hands on that. Yes, that happened. That I, happy. I would love to see you come on the show with a butter emails hat. <laughs> I don't think it's gonna happen. <laughs> Maybe we'll see. <laughs> anyway, with all that said, uh, we are going to take a break. When we come back, we got two stories having to do with religion. They're absolute bananas. That's how we're gonna close out the hour for you. So stick around, we'll be right back. Okay, everybody hold on to your butts. We're about to get into crazy territory with our little religion block here. A mom in Tennessee has quite a few interesting revelations coming from what she says her child, her daughter, was taught in a Bible history class, including, quote, and I can't believe this is a thing that needs to be said in a news story, how to torture a Jew. This is all coming from this class. We're gonna break it down give you the information you need. So this program is called Bible in the Schools. And it partners with nearly 30 public middle and high schools in Hamilton County, Tennessee, offering four credit elective classes about the Bible during normal school hours. The local Christian organization pays school districts to teach those classes. Last year, the nonprofit donated almost $2 million. And so the student in question is a 13 year old who spent about two weeks in the class before her mom took her out as a result of her daughter's experiences in the class. By the way, this class says that while they are studying the Christian Bible, it is designed to be a viewpoint neutral course. This is not Bible study a la what you would do in an actual church. It's supposed to be the academic study of the Bible, of which you know there's all sorts of classes like this in college where you study different religions and everything. Anyway, Russo, the mom in question, her daughter said her teacher told the story, told the class a story about an atheist student who took a Bible class hoping to quote prove it wrong, but ended up quote realizing it was true, which is an interesting anecdote to throw into a class, but so far not too bad. Next, her daughter showed her a class quiz, which included a true or false question that stated, Quote, there is no reason to study the Bible if you are not a Christian or Jew. 
Russo's daughter marked the question true, but her teacher marked her answer incorrect. I could almost see a case for that. We should be familiar with different religious texts. It doesn't mean you have to accept its lessons. But then we get into crazy territory. So on February 2nd, when Judith Russo's daughter came home from school and told her mother that she no longer felt safe in the class, Russo's daughter said her teacher that day had written the English spelling of the Hebrew name of God on the whiteboard. Jewish people typically don't speak the transliteration of the name aloud. And so the daughter said that the, the teacher told her, quote, if you want to know how to torture a Jew, make them say this out loud, which is really crazy. Now, we do have to bear in mind that this is a story the 13 year old is relaying to her mom who is relaying to the news was. With all that said, there does seem like there are potentially some issues in this course. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's so much sensitivity around religion, religion, which you know obviously mm -hmm. has been the case for centuries now, right? Uh, this isn't a new thing. Uh, the sensitivity around different religions. Obviously, I'm somebody who thinks that theology is a worthwhile endeavor uh, because if only to think that I think if more people were exposed to the actual texts of these religions, they'd be more inclined to be repelled by them. So I do think <laughs> that exposure to you know the religious texts and just all of the contradictor contradictions and vagaries of all the religions, um, I think it's important to expose people to young people. If they're even semi curious, can ask themselves basic questions about the lessons they're supposed to infer from some of these uh, documents, right? Um, however, what we're talking about is an adult just being bad at their job. You know, um, you, knowing how to communicate to these young people is literally job number one. Like even more so than the material, it's how do you effectively communicate it more so than anything that makes you great at what you do as a teacher. Um, and this person just kind of failed the students in a way that is very unfortunate yeah. and 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 whack, quite frankly. But you know, I'm not somebody who's scared of. Kids being exposed to religion because I know as a young person, some of that stuff I was just like, "Come on, really?" <laughs> he walked on water, really. That was where you drew the line, the water thing. I just no, I don't see it happening. You want to know where I drew the line, John? It was the idea that God did not want me to masturbate because it was a sin. I was just <laughs> like, "This, this just ain't. It just ain't no way. There's no yeah. way." Okay, I'll accept possible. the water and the wine, maybe even the walking <laughs> on water thing. But you got to stay out of my bedroom. <laughs> a just God um, could never do that. No, that's true. I think that indisputable, and that should be taught in these courses. So yeah, look, I think uh, you could chalk it up to the teacher doing a bad thing. I mean, any teacher can mess things up, and when you, even if this was a totally viewpoint neutral thing, and, and by the way, you don't have to accept that it would be. I mean, the fact that there is an involvement of a church like. That should lead some people to be worried. Um, some teachers are religious, some teachers aren't. Are they gonna approach the material in the same way? Are they gonna have equal sensitivity to the religious backgrounds or non-religious backgrounds of the students? Not necessarily, and it's too bad because I think this is the sort of thing that should be taught. I think academically, different religious texts, the histories of different religions are really important and interesting. And I don't think that people should be leaving high school, leaving college without understanding these very important social cultural things. But we also shouldn't be using public schools to indoctrinate people into what I would say religions. But let's be clear, it would only ever be into one religion in the US context. No one's accidentally indoctrinating kids into Islam in Tennessee. That ain't gonna happen. And we know that like so like any of the any right winger commenting on this, you cannot trust because they want the indoctrination. They want Pro Christian propaganda in schools, which is not what public schools are supposed to be about. Let's be clear about that. In any yeah, event, you know, no, also, you know, I just, I just like the idea that somebody in Tennessee would need to be indoctrinated into Christianity. That seems a little far fetched to me, from what I understand mm -hmm. about the South and their religiosity um, as just a collective of people. Yeah, yeah, they're probably going to come across it anyway. <laughs> In any event, uh, yeah, the, um, so. <laughs> the schools looked into this and they uh, put out a statement last Friday saying that uh, the teacher referenced the fact that Jewish people do not say the Hebrew name of God 
telling students that to hear or say that word would be quote, would be a torturous or difficult experience for them. But they say we cannot conclude that the teacher intended to actually instruct her students about how to torture a Jewish person. And none of the students interviewed who recalled the comment interpreted it negatively. While it does not appear that the statement was intended to cause offense, it did. So that is, that's not the worst statement I've seen. It might be giving the teacher too much credit, but we weren't in the classroom. We don't know. Uh, I would say use it as a learning experience. Definitely look into the materials because if we jump ahead, some of the imagery that they use is a little bit weird, showing like what seem like kind of stereotypical image. Like I don't. It's just it's a difficult <laughs> bit of territory, is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it, it look it's it's hard, it's hard to cover the Bible in any like serious sense without brushing directly up against our modern societal taboos, right? Um, you think about something like slavery or yeah. you think about the practice of polygamy, <laughs> you know, like these things are all over the, the Bible, murder, treachery, it's it's all there. And then of course, problematic depictions or what we you know we that we accept as just straight up racist depictions of Jewish people for sure man mm -hmm. like if people want to have those interpretations of the bible they can absolutely do that yeah yeah 100% well, let's move into even weirder territory to uh end this first hour <clears throat> A Catholic priest has now resigned after being informed of the fact that he had been apparently incorrectly performing baptisms for over 20 years, rendering the right in the words and I guess the view of the Catholic Church invalid for literally thousands of people. So this is Reverend Andre Zarango. He apparently would say during the baptism ritual, quote, we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. However, we now learn the correct wording is I baptize per the Vatican's instruction. And according to a bishop in Phoenix, no one including priests may add, remove or change anything on his own authority. They added that Father Arango, they, they have no reason to believe that he had intentions to harm the faithful or deprive them of the great grace of baptism. But despite them saying we have no reason to believe this was intentional, we're still gonna go ahead with invalidating thousands of baptisms. So they said that that one word alteration means that all of the baptisms he's performed for over 20 years are presumed invalid. And they have uh, they've put up some information for people to get rebaptized, which they're saying is a thing you need to do. Although don't they kind of have a bias to want to get you back in there again? What is the actual <laughs> difference with that one word? Why would God care about any of this? That is that is that is the million dollar question. Um, when it pertain as it pertains to so much of religious doctrine and people who get all bent out of shape about the finer tuned points about what mm -hmm. this all knowing, all seeing loving just God really would care about it really be boiling down to whether you eat pork or not like really like chicken is just that much better than pork like I don't I don't understand this this seems like one of those same things where it's like really this one word is gonna invalidate your your birth into Christianity which is what baptisms are supposed to represent mm -hmm. I mean come on yeah, I get that you're supposed to have rules, but I feel like this was a great, easy opportunity for the church there to be like, "Oh man, well, that's unfortunate," <laughs> but um, but we don't care. Obviously, you're still good people, and the the guy's resigning. Of all of the things for Catholic priests to be pushed out for, this is the thing you're gonna get him for. The one word. Uh. I have a different one word you could have taken seriously for a few thousand years, a few hundred years, at the very least. Oh, man. Um, this is not the one, I versus we. Anyway, that is unfortunate all the time we have for our first hour, but we do have a lot more to talk about, including a big strike going on in Puerto Rico, uh, horrible uh, treatment of uh, prisoners at a California prison. So don't go anywhere. We got more news with Waz after this. 
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.